Uh, first, I want to start off by playing a clip of uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, here he is speaking on the uh, eve of the 2003 invasion and occupation of the Iraq War. What I'm condemning is that one power with a president who has no foresight, who cannot think properly, is now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust as a departure in almost everything that we do. And if there is a country that has committed unspeakable atrocities in the world, it is the United States of America. They don't care. I want to welcome to the program Bob Herbert. He's a former New York Times uh, columnist and a fellow at Demos. Uh, welcome to the program, Bob. Good to be here, Sam. So I, I wanted to play that clip uh, right off uh, off the top because it was uh, it was not a clip that we saw played a lot um, as uh, people re um, <laughs> remembered uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and. I think it speaks to at least part of what uh, you were trying to get at with your piece um, in the Jacobin. Um, the, uh, the, the real Nelson Mandela. Tell us what you uh, were concerned uh, at, would get lost as people reflected on his life. Well, you know, I agree. The tendency is to, when a giant like this dies, to turn him into some kind of uh, universal feel-good figure. Uh, he stands for all the things that everybody can stand for, all the, all the platitudes. He's almost like a, uh, a, a stick figure, a cardboard uh, character. Um, and I thought that the same thing uh, has been done over the decades with uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Junior, so they're in favor of peace and they're in favor of brotherhood, and you know who's who's not in favor of that sort of thing. And um, you know the piece that that I wrote was to say that um, while these were certainly not haters and that they were ultimately men of peace, that to just see them in that light is to miss their significance, to miss their historical importance. That these were defiant figures of resistance against um, uh, terribly evil occurrences, you know, that both in their own way uh, were fighting against uh, racial oppression, um, uh, apartheid in South Africa and then terrible uh, segregation and other, uh, other racial injustices in the United States. And so these were truth tellers. They were firebrands. They were liberators. I wrote that above all, they were warriors. And I thought, um, that that's the way that they should be remembered, and 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 you know I think lost too. I think in, in, is the the idea that Nelson Mandela, while I mean I, I don't know what the definition of a man of peace is, but he certainly did not renounce violence. I mean that was um, uh, central to why he was kept in prison for twenty seven. Yeah, he, he absolutely did not renounce violence. He felt. Um, that in some cases, um, and I got the impression in reading the historical record that he, he saw violence as a last resort, but not the sort of thing that could be taken off the table. And he was, in fact, in charge of the, um, essentially, the, the uh, military wing of the African National uh, Congress. And um, their stated goal was to use violence if necessary, but to use it against state facilities and to try and um, minimize human casualties as much as possible. But what, what they essentially were saying was that um, violence was an integral part of their strategy going forward, that they were going to do whatever was necessary to bring down apartheid. And that's what I was, uh, one of the things that I, that I um, really wanted to emphasize, that um, with both King and with Nelson Mandela, it, it, it wasn't a case of these guys should be remembered as someone who could lock arms with their enemies, who could embrace their foes and, 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 and bring us to uh, a state of peace and brotherhood in, in that way. These were guys who were determined to bring the enemy to their knees, to win this uh, 
uh, to win this fight, to do, to do all the things necessary to succeed. And then when they succeeded in freeing their people or achieving justice for their people, uh, then they could forgive. They weren't about uh, vengeance. They weren't about um, hatred or reprisals and that sort of thing. But the first order of business was to free the people. And, and do you think, I mean, this, I mean that, that distinction, the notion of that, the, it's a it's a theory of power that you you must de, you must defeat this what you're fighting against before you can interlock arms uh, on some level. I mean that is something that dynamic. There's there's a particular anathema to that in the, in in our society. I mean, and I I speak that you know with the sort of the the, the limitations on my understanding of other societies, but that seems to be sort of fundamental. I mean, we see that across the board in terms of social movements in this country, that um, they are... I, I, go ahead. I agree, uh, you know, and I, I've actually um, publicly talked a lot about how I'm upset at the absence of militancy um, that, that I see in the society on a number of fronts. I mean, if we're talking about economic justice, if we're talking about the continuing racial injustice that that occurs in this society, uh, when, when we're when we're talking about um, all all the various forms of unfairness uh, that are in the society right now, they sh- they should be fought against, and and they need to be fought against militantly. And and by militantly, I don't mean violently. I'm not suggesting that people take up arms or something like that. But short of violence, I, I think people really do, as you point out. Uh, need to take the steps necessary to defeat their enemies, to defeat their foe, to um, to win, to achieve the goals that you've stated uh, for yourself. And, you know, what both you and I are talking about are legitimate goals. We're not talking about trying to bring about a state of affairs that's going to be uh, a state of affairs that's going to be unfair to other people. We're trying to eradicate injustice. And I agree with you with the tendency now, and it's a widespread tendency, is to start with the idea of, you know, you're going to reach out and embrace the people who are on the other side as if somehow that's going to magically um, bring about the ends that you're seeking. And that is, as you pointed out, a misreading of, of how one goes about achieving power or utilizing power to achieve desired ends. You know, I mean, it's fascinating because I, we can see this in, in, in just about, I mean, you know, when we look back, uh, for instance, on just sort of on on, uh, on on what unions and what labor did in this country, um, the there was a tremendous, I mean, in, in, in some instances there was uh, violence, but there was a tremendous amount of militancy. I mean, what is it, I mean, about... I mean, I wonder. I, I mean, I imagine obviously in 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 South Africa, the 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 whitewashing can't really take place in the way that it, it, it takes place in, in this country from afar. But we somehow have managed to do it uh, in rather short time when it comes to uh, figures like Martin Luther King. Um, what wh- what accounts for that? I think. Um you know, I think what happens is some of the things that have gone on and in, in some cases are still going on are um, so terrible, so horrible, that people really don't want to think about it. Uh, when you have the atrocities in the past, if they're over, then the tendency is to put it out of sight, out of mind. You know, go back into this idea of, you know, hey, it's a wonderful society, justice uh, prevailed. Uh, That's really sort of what happens in the United States in in any event. And then you don't really have to spend any time um, immersed in the awful things that occurred. And it allows you, at, at some point, to, to to almost believe that they they really weren't as horrible as as some people have said. Would you know? Why do you keep wallowing in it? But the other thing that happens is, it can make you miss the point of what is still occurring. This idea of living in a state of denial can become widespread. So you don't acknowledge the injustices that are still occurring, and you don't acknowledge how you contribute to that injustice uh, 
uh, by not speaking out or, or, or acting to take uh, care of it. I, I, I do think that it's sort of a widespread form of um, societal denial. And I think that it's dangerous because the other side um, does not approach these matters that way. The other side is very serious. The other side is um, very fierce, and the injustices still occur. And, and, and a way of looking at it now is to see what, what's happening with low-wage workers in this um, economy, to see the way the great corporations have just dumped millions of people out of jobs, just thrown, you know, over the, over the past several years, just thrown millions of people out of jobs without any care of what that does to the individuals or their families or to the economy as as a whole, so um, that sort of thing needs to be fought against, and it needs to be fought against, um, in my view, furiously. You know, we're getting a little bit uh, a field from from uh, your piece to a certain extent, but 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 as we're talking about this, I mean, I had just read uh, a piece, and uh, for the life of me, I cannot write, uh, remember who who read it, but. It was analyzing President Obama's inequality uh, speech from a couple of weeks ago and noticed that the 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 it was all sort of in the passive sense. In other words, that inequality just happened Uh, and there was no uh, agency, which is not to suggest that he was uh, 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 responsible necessarily. But um, this notion of these things just occur and then they just go away. (laughs) <laughs> on some level. Uh, and, and and it also reminds me of when President Obama um, uh, came into office and said we need to turn the page on things like uh, uh, on Iraq and exactly. on torture. I mean, these are all um, this is all sort of part of that societal tick that we have in some way. Exactly. So it's, it's almost like pretending that that stuff never happened or that, or that that stuff is over. When you talk about um, this inequality that is plaguing the country now, um, it, it, as you noted, it didn't just happen. These were all policy decisions over the past 30 or 40 years that were um, designed to, um, re- and it's a term that you're not even supposed to use, you know, redistribution of the wealth, but this was designed to redistribute wealth from the um, from the middle classes and lower income people to the top, and those policy uh, choices have worked remarkably well, which is why you know we're so top heavy with the wealth in this country. And now, if people come along and they um, they want to correct this sort of imbalance, that they want um, a more fair distribution of of uh, wealth and income, um, the argument is that you're fomenting class warfare. So you're not even allowed to talk about redistribution of wealth if what you mean is to redistribute it, redistribute some of it from the top down. But the reality is that nearly all the wealth in this country over the past 40 years has been redistributed from the middle and the bottom up. And, and one thing in terms of another parallel between uh, uh, Mandela and, and, and King is the... I guess the the downplaying or the de-emphasis on their uh, a broader uh, perspective on social justice. I mean, uh, you know, which is part of the reason why I wanted to play that that, that clip of of uh, the uh, of, of Mandela prior to Iraq. But it also uh, it, I'm also thinking in terms of economic justice that that part of their legacies. In many respects, you know, and obviously for different reasons, maybe between Mandela and King, has also been very much, I guess, sort of uh, shuffled down the, the rabbit hole. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, and it's why um, it was so appropriate to begin this segment with that clip. And as I was listening to it, it made me think of um, uh, Dr. King when he spoke out in 1967 against the Vietnam War and and declared that the United States was the greatest purveyor of violence uh, in the world. And at the time, he was widely denounced uh, uh, for for that speech and for those comments. And um, even the New York Times took him to task in an editorial. The headline on the editorial was Dr. King's Error. Um, so, so when they were talking, you, you know, you talk about the justice um, that's denied as a result of violence and, and, and warfare, and then, of course, the economic justice. I mean, pe- people have tended to forget that the March on Washington was a, was a march for jobs and freedom. I mean, that was the, um, that was the title uh, 
uh, of the march. Everybody tends to think of it as, you know, a march for civil rights. And then you can say, well, we don't have segregation in this country or you don't have legal segregation anymore. So the civil rights movement uh, won. But we still don't have um, economic justice in this country. And you still don't have economic justice in South Africa. So um, these are ongoing fights, and you, you undermine those struggles when you sort of take the militancy of great figures like Dr. King and Mandela uh, off the board. So th- th- then they don't serve as the kind of, in my view, the kind of inspiration um, that that they should that they should be known for. And, they and, should be and they should be figures of inspiration for people today who are militantly fighting against injustice. And 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 that's part of the. I mean, that's that's. I mean, that's not necessarily a coincidence. I mean, uh, I mean, I, maybe that's even. An <laughs> I don't think it. I agree with you. It's not a coincidence. And and what's interesting too is that uh, Mandela never really was able to um, to. Uh, did, did not have the success, or I don't know even if it's even fair to say necessarily that he jettisoned that part of the agenda upon sort of the the um, the racial emancipation in South Africa. Uh, but it's almost as if like you know that was that's just one bridge too far, <laughs> you know. You know, that's really interesting, and it's something that I've uh, thought a lot about, and and actually sort of struggled with um, intellectually. It, and I, I just think that after a while, um, cause it, and, and I think it applies to Dr. King as well as, well as Nelson Mandela, um, after a while, we, you, you can almost ask too much of an individual. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to have them serve as inspirations, so that what, what you want is to... Um, Develop leaders for an ongoing struggle, put, because all of this stuff takes a really long time. It takes decades. I mean, look how long, if you go back to the early days of the labor movement, look how long it took to get uh, to get reasonable success for workers uh, in this country, which, by the way, is being, or those successes are being rolled back now. So um, it, there's only so much, I guess, that an individual can do. And when you have these movements, the civil rights movement, um, which I've studied in, intensely in, in this country, uh, they didn't really um, create a cadre of leaders to follow uh, after the great leaders of the 1950s and 60s, to follow after uh, King and his colleagues. And, um, and I do think that you can lose ground or, or you can achieve um, some of your goals, but, but not all of your goals. It's, it's, it's very difficult to sustain. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, part of that, I think, is that you don't have the resources to create institutions that can outlive um, the the individual leaders and outlive them, you know, beyond the past where they have a certain amount of energy as well. I mean, these... See, I think that's, I think that's a really good point, and, and therefore it's a point that uh, folks who care about economic justice, racial justice, justice of all kinds, should be paying closer attention to how do you begin to establish those kinds of institutions. I, I think that's really important because I think that uh, if you look at uh, what conditions are in the United States, and, and they're certainly not uh, limited to black people in the United States. I mean, there are so many people who are struggling uh, uh, now economically and socially that that there. I think there's going to we're going to need another broad-based movement comparable to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. And so um, you look to those movements and you say, well, where did they come up short? Or, um, you know, where could they have done better? And your point about creating these kinds of institutions that can sustain a movement um, is really an important point, and I think people ought to be looking closely at that. And, and do you think, I mean, you know, because this is something that is also, you know, I've been obviously the past couple of years been 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 sort of contemplating this notion of, you know, in this country, the, the uh, at least, you know, in the context of the Democratic Party, there was this, this cleave um, uh, 
that that occurred in the late 60s between sort of the the economic populist parts of the Democratic Party and the social emancipation movements. And uh, for a long time, these were at odds with each other, at least, you know, in, in, in some areas. I mean, you know, uh, supposedly creating to the extent that it's mythological or, or real, but the, the, the Reagan Democrats, uh, if you will. And on some level that, you know, now that we are, if not, uh, if not, uh, obviously we haven't completed the sort of social emancipation projects that were, were, were started in the 60s, but in some ways um, there's been a, just a tremendous amount of progress uh, and that particularly you can see this in the younger generations who, you know, the, the ideas of their grandparents just seem completely just as, as foreign, I mean, as, as foreign as they could be <laughs> in many respects. I mean, do you think that we are on the precipice of, you know, as we see this generation getting older and are no longer able to be sort of uh, the, the wedge issues of, of race and of gender and of sexual orientation don't have the same uh, efficacy as they had, you know, in, in, the, in the case of, uh, of sexual orientation, you know, this was... This has been an unbelievable flip, at least in terms of a political cudgel, you know, from from where it was 10 years ago. Um, you know, um, the wedge issues just don't have the clout that they once had. They, they, they once were spectacularly um, successful. And when you when you talk about um, injustice and, and I've run into this a lot. You have to be really careful because you're talking about injustices that are that are still occurring in in, in many cases, um, you know, r really terrible injustices, and, and you want to fight strongly against them. But it is a mistake uh, if you don't acknowledge how far we've come over the past uh, half century or, or, or so, and, and in many cases, uh, just in the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, I'm old enough now. When I, when I look at, at at where this country was when I was a, a young man, and 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 where we are now, and it's just night and day in terms of um, attitudes, uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, just just in in many ways. I've I've often said publicly that um, my father, who was a, a very smart man, he could not have had any of the jobs that I had in my entire career and that's because that he because he was black he he just never would have been permitted to have those jobs so he couldn't have been a reporter at the Star Ledger or at the Daily News he couldn't have been a correspondent for NBC he couldn't have been a columnist for the New York Times and that's just in one generation so in one generation uh, we've made enough progress that I was able to have that kind of a career um, um, that I was able to have um, you mentioned what's happened with gays. So I was in um, school in the 1950s and 60s, and it, it, the idea that you could if, forget the reality of, of gay marriage, for example, the idea that you could even have a conversation about gays getting married would have just staggered the imagination. You, would, <laughs> you wouldn't have been able um, to believe it. You, you would think, who would talk about that? You know, not even in, in public. No one was even talking about that um, in private, uh, un unless uh, you know, unless you uh, you were gay or or or, or you had a, a close relationship with someone who was gay. So we've made astonishing progress over the past um, several decades, but it's a measure of how deep some of the injustices are that we that, that we still have. Um, so much terrain still to travel. Right. I mean, I wonder, you know, if we're starting to see some uh, some of these sort of the as these uh, these wedge issues lose their potency. And, and, and again, this is not to say that they're they're These are n still not contentious and um, uh, that they've been resolved. But but in sort of like broader uh, political terms. I mean, even, you know, uh, the one of the things, the most interesting developments, I think, you know, from the, the 2012 election was that we're starting to see um, uh, Democrats and the left come out from the other side of 
trying to uh, hold hands on the on the questions of of choice, you know, where uh, where there has been more of a full throated defense for for women to be uh, full people uh, in in our society, which I think is a big change again over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, I agree. I, I was waiting anxiously for for this to emerge. It seemed to me that it was taking the longest time um, for this to develop. And 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 now that that the, you know, I mean, it it starts to bring about this sort of tension of like, what are the, what is going to be the the defining you know the battle? I mean, getting back uh, to Mandela at this point, when we talk about. <clears throat> you know, vanquishing the enemies on some level, it's a question of really starting to to name those enemies in, in some way that is is not, um, I guess, uh, obscured by um, sort of the 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 social emancipation fights. I mean, because we now know who the enemies are in those fights and we know where the battle lines are and it's all if it's not um, those projects are not finished, at least the battle lines are clear. Um, and it still seems to be uh, ill-defined uh, in the context of, of economic justice in this country. I think that I think that's true. I, I, but what I think is going to be the um, I think economic justice is going to be the defining issue um, going forward, even though there are uh, other very important uh, issues and there's still uh, important racial justice issues and that sort of thing out there. But I think that because so many people are struggling economically and we see the protests and the strikes by low-wage workers and that sort of thing, but I've also seen uh, kids coming out of uh, college with four-year degrees, coming out of terrific colleges and universities who are unable to find um, uh, full-time work or are unable to find work that actually required a college degree. Um, they have these college loans um, weighing them down, and it's becoming more and more difficult for young people, even with a decent education, to um, establish a mature adult quality of life where you can get married if, if you want to and, and, and ha- begin to have a family and make that first down payment on a home. Um, and so, and I think that looking around, people are just going to see, wow, there's more and more people in this same boat. And I do think that that's going to be the defining issue going forward. But, but, you know, you need leaders to emerge. Uh, you need uh, decent thinkers who can uh, um, formulate strategies and tactics uh, going forward. But I think that it's going to become such a compelling issue. And I actually think in some cases the pain is just going to be so great that people are going to say, hey, you know, we really have to rise up and do something. So, so lastly, I mean, in, if, if from your perspective, I mean, do you have a, a favorite book or speech or something that uh, people sh- you, you would recommend if they wanted to go back to get to capture the essence of of uh, of Nelson Mandela um, in a way that is uh, not as sort of I guess glossed over. Uh, what what would you suggest for folks? Oh, I I I think his um, his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, um, w- which a fair number of people know about, but a lot fewer fewer people actually read, um, lays out um, the struggle and um, and his view and. Um, his efforts and, and, and those of the people in the fight uh, with him, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a terrific starting point. But also along those lines, and um, Dr. King almost um, has become like a, a cliche. <laughs> you know, you say Martin Luther King, and everybody has this image of, of, of Martin Luther King. One of the things is that he always seems older than he actually was. He was only right. 39 right. Um, when he was killed. But what well, We've missed the lesson of Dr. King, and I would really recommend that people go back and uh, read about his life. There, there have been uh, two or three really terrific biographies out there, but, but also read Dr. King's own writings. And you'll see the richness in there that, of course, there was the racial struggle and the fight for civil rights, but he was so clear about the idea that the racial struggle was entwined with the struggle for economic rights, 
that and that economic rights crossed racial lines that you that you needed economic justice and and you needed to um, bring people out of poverty no matter where they were or who they were and then when he um, would uh, sort of counsel that you can't make the kind of progress we need to make here at home if we're going to have these uh, these foreign wars, these foreign ad, ad, adventures that, that make no sense and that are, are so tragic in their ultimate outcomes and that uh, devour so many of the resources that are needed here at home. King was all over all of that stuff. And then beyond that, he understood the importance and how to go about direct action to begin to counter um, uh, the, the the forces on the other side. So I mean, there's just a richness uh, to this man's young life and 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 thinking um, that's amazing and that still talks to me today. And I think if people would go back and look at Dr. King's life uh, in a serious way, um, they'll be surprised at how appropriate everything he was dealing with is to our state of affairs today. Bob Herbert, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Sam. Great to talk with you.